We're about to uh, we're about to enjoy another American accent. Mike Strobel was asking, I uh, was referring to someone asking in America whether uh, they thought that they, uh, he'd be understood in Australia. Uh, it reminded me that in 1992 I was very kindly uh, invited as a guest of the U.S. government, which means the U.S. taxpayer, of course, to a study tour of America. So we, you know, did all the interesting places uh, on the east, Washington, New York, Chicago, and then found my way back to have the last few days on a bit of a farm tour. Flew into Kansas City, which of course is not in Kansas State. That's relevant because I picked up a little rented car, rental car, and had a couple of days in Missouri or Missouri, or however you pronounce it, and then drove west into Kansas to connect with a friend from KSA. Uh, and uh, I got lost on a little back road uh, north of Topeka, the capital of Kansas. Pulled up outside a little, uh, they'd say weather, timber frame house, I suppose. We'd say weatherboard, you know, a little classic American farmhouse, but fairly decrepit, to uh, ask the lady who was standing outside for directions. And so I pulled up, and I, you know how frustrated you get when you just cannot work out where you are? And that was the mood I was in, and I probably rather rudely, I wound down the window of the little red candy red Pontiac that I was driving. I had a map on the steering wheel. And here is this lady, I would say about 45, a bit unkempt, but underneath it all quite attractive, with a, <laughs> with a, with a pet raccoon on her shoulders. <laughs> I got to tell this story to George Bush, as a matter of fact, at a lunch party here when he was in Australia, and he interrupted me and said, do you have any teeth? <laughs> and she had with her her three children. So it was a, a young lass who, like her mother, you know, was very attractive, I have to say, and uh, she was about uh, 14 or so, and then a boy about 12 and a younger girl, three of them. So I wind down the window, and I, 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 I promise you, my words were very simple. I didn't say very much. One American is a minute. I just said, excuse me, ma'am, I've got myself lost. Can you show me where I am on this map? Well, the boy, the one, the lad about 12, looks up at his mother sharply and exclaims, hey, mama, this dude talks just like Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> well, she grabs those chicks and yanks them back out of the way. The raccoon takes off. Must have thought I was going to produce a real knife. And she drags them sort of towards the front of the car with one eye on me and the other following the shut line on the bonnet. And I think she's got to look at the licence plates. Sure enough, she sees them. All the tension and alarm goes out of the body. She relaxes. She said, it's all right, boy. He's not from Australia. He's just from Missouri. <laughs> well, Dr Bill Gates, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the United States Study Centre at the University of Sydney. It's a great privilege to have you here. The centre, I think I'm right in saying, was sent up by a great government. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I did not not here to be political, but it was a great government. It's great to have you here. Thank you for the work that you do. Uh, I believe that uh, we've seen today the enormous value of the contribution the centre is making. Uh, and we're appreciative uh, of that to our American friends, if I can say that. Uh, and we think this initiative is very worthwhile indeed. So please take the podium, Bill. Uh, Bates, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Yes, indeed. Uh, the U.S. Studies Center was founded about uh, 10 years ago, at the time of the John Howard government, uh, who felt it was very important to establish in Australia something which hadn't yet really been uh, established, surprisingly, given the relationship between our two countries, and that is a center uh, that would be devoted uh, for raising awareness and understanding about the United States here in Australia and increasingly around the world. Um, and as I say, we're going to be celebrating our 10th anniversary next year, and I think we've done quite well by that initial investment uh, from the Australian government and have gone uh, leaps and bounds uh, to attract uh, friends and supporters from across a variety of sectors, and even increasingly from the United States itself. Um, the mission that we have is, like I say, to help raise awareness and understanding about the United States. We do this through a number of ways. Um, one is, and really our core mission, is working with young people at the University of Sydney primarily, but we've opened up a sister institution at the University of Western Australia in Perth called the Perth US Asia Center and working with primarily undergraduate students, uh, delivering a range of courses and other opportunities like study abroad, intern abroad, intern placements abroad in the United States, and through uh, those vehicles, 
reach to the next generation of Australians uh, who are going to be living in a world uh, in which the United States will continue to play an ever-increasing uh, role and have impact on their futures. We do it through a pretty active media presence uh, on the radio, television, op-eds and the like, and increasingly in the digital space uh, to comment on all aspects of what's happening in the United States and why it matters to Australia and why it matters to the world. And we do it through a number of think tank activities, is what we call them, such as the one we're convening here today. And I want to extend my gratitude once again to, to Andrea Koch for her fantastic work in developing, carving out a true policy area niche for herself and for the center, I have to say, taking leadership here in Australia to convene an organ a, a group of people like this and to reach out to our friends and partners in the United States to attract them here and for them to see us as partners in their work uh, back on the other side of the Pacific to drive forward policy solutions on big ideas. Uh, in addition to the sorts of work we're doing here today, uh, we're engaged in a range of other activities, ranging from uh, alternative uh, fuels to uh, looking at the American alliance, our relationships across educational issues. Just today, uh, we've got a delegation of city council members from the Sydney area traveling around the United States as part of our Future Cities Collaborative, where again, exchanges can take place to learn how common problems can be dealt, perhaps in different ways, but in ways that we can learn from one another. And the work we're doing today, I think, is just one more great example of the kind of uh, work we can deliver here in Australia and in the United States. Um, we know that uh, the issues of data analysis and the application of digital and uh, big data uh, uh, product to the kinds of answers we want to find in agriculture is really uh, in, its, in its infancy. And in that sense, I think we have to recognize that it really will be the young people uh, in this room and beyond who are going to be taking many of the ideas that we're just beginning to talk about here and fully realizing them uh, for the promise that they hold out to us. Um, it was in that light, then, that we wanted to encourage young people in agriculture and related industries and in academia to engage with this conference. So uh, in order to do that, we held a competition in which we offered to young people from the ages of 18 to 30 to tell us in 1,600 words or through a short video what their vision is. What is their vision for the future of agriculture in Australia and even globally? We were very happy with the results. We had 15 excellent entries from all across Australia, including, I think quite remarkably, one from a year 12, it's 12th grade for the Americans out there, year 12 student from Victoria. Uh, and we're very, very pleased uh, to uh, then extend to the winner the opportunity to, take, to join us here at this conference uh, and be able to appear in front of the audience this afternoon. So I'm very, very proud then now to uh, introduce the winner of the competition. Uh, his name is Timothy, Timothy Smith. Tim is from Melbourne. He is currently studying a Master of Agribusiness at the University of Melbourne. He comes to that job, though, from already having some very, very interesting professional experience, having spent four years in Hong Kong, where uh, he was doing, among other things, analysis and uh, facilitation of investment by China uh, into the ag, ag sector and other extractive industry sectors here in Australia. So uh, he's already had a significant uh, degree of professional experience uh, in looking at the Australia agricultural sector, and now he's digging into it even deeper uh, by receiving his Master of Agribusiness at the University of Melbourne. Uh, Tim submitted a fantastic uh, video which outlaid his vision for the future of agriculture, but we thought you'd uh, enjoy even more the opportunity to hear from him in person. So let me please introduce you, Tim. Oh dear, I've forgotten your last name. I'm terrible. How could I have forgotten that? Tim Smith, thank you. Thanks a lot, Gil. Yeah, Smith's an easy one. Um, it's funny because on my first day of work, I, as a professional, I was 21 and I put on 
my suit and I iron my shirt and I got the train into work and the chairman comes and introduces himself to me and I was full of ambition and he said to me amongst other things, Tim, nobody will take you seriously until you're 30. Um, so that was the first bit of professional advice I ever got. Um, so that put me in good stead. But it's good to know that Andrea and her team do take people under 30 seriously, uh, seriously enough to sort of put forward this competition and give me the opportunity to present uh, my vision on the future of agriculture in Australia. So as Gil said, um, I've spent the last four years in Hong Kong and, and now I'm convinced that it is the right time for Australia to fully focus on the future of agriculture into the Asian century. So between now and 2050, we will see a major transformation in the Australian agricultural sector, primarily driven by two things, the rising middle class of Asia and the incorporation of technology across the entire value chain. Short term, we will see continued consolidation in the market. However, it won't be until the incorporation of technology in the sector in order to yield higher returns and reduce agricultural risk that we'll see the capital held by private equity and funds enter the sector. Cross-border trade will continue to be a major focus for agribusinesses, but we will see the power of trade held by the demand side rather than the supply side. This will mean Australia's influence on trade in the region will be a relatively passive one. Our role will be to lead by example, and to do so, we must be at the forefront of technology and be the best in class. While there is an element of advanced technology already incorporated in Australian agriculture, including things like drones, automated tractors and watering systems, the next wave of technology will be disruptive technology and that will make the sector even more efficient and more competitive with the rest of the world. The technology will be based on three things. The Internet of Things, big data and 3D printing. 20 billion devices are expected to be connected over the next five years. These connections will create an unprecedented volume of data that can be analysed to draw insights like never before. These insights will in turn give us machine learning and artificial intelligence and the automation of processes will help Australia address the lack of affordable labour. Automation is crucial to allow producers to focus on more strategic, social and creative aspects of agriculture. Machines will be able to complete basic tasks at higher speeds and with greater accuracy than humans. This will reduce the cost of production and waste, resulting in a high quality, affordable food and making it accessible to everyone around the world. It will create a sector that is more efficient and ultimately more profitable. As the market consolidation continues, big data will allow a company within a shared network to collaborate and draw best insight from practice around the world. These sharing networks will be managed and coordinated by the largest producers. By 2050, I believe 3D printers will be producing 20% of the food we consume. Connected by the Internet of Things, this printer will not only be able to um, produce and execute delivery of the product, but through wearables on the end consumer. Based on physical reactions, the machine will know whether the consumer actually enjoyed the food. This technology is not an entitlement to the sector. There will be challenges. And for technology to percolate down the chain, it will take major investment from the sector's largest players. There will be efficiency gaps between those that can afford to implement the technology and those that can't. It is crucial that producers adopt emerging technologies so they don't get left behind. We will see more companies becoming vertically integrated and with predictive analytics creating a seamless process and the removal of relying on outsourcing at any stage of the value chain. But what is the first step towards all of this? A common challenge in vast rural Australia, as we've discussed today, are data and Wi-Fi black spots but Angus mentioned this is being addressed and so did Barnaby Joyce. Production cost was always cheaper the closer the producer was to a transport hub. Soon it will be more important for a producer to be closer to good Wi-Fi than a port. Other perceived challenges will be that sharing of data may remove competitive advantage amongst producers. Why should they share best practice? It is also crucial that privacy regulators establish a sound regulatory framework to ensure data is protected. These challenges can be addressed in order to ensure that this technology helps Australia capitalise on the Asian century. 
Thank you. Well, that was an excellent, uh, an excellent segue into the next session. Peter Leonard from Gilbert and Tobin is now uh, to address us. If I could ask uh, Peter up. Where are you, Peter? Right here. Sorry, on my table. Um, uh, to uh, address some of the issues surrounding privacy and the law. Thank you. Thanks, John. Look, I'm, uh, I'm going to be quite short today. I'm conscious of two things. Um, the first is that uh, I'm the last person standing b between you and the keynote. And uh, the second is that uh, I'm a lawyer addressing a room full of farmers about trust. And uh, I fear that that might be a bridge too far. But what I'm going to talk about is really um, a common issue that I face as a lawyer working, in, working with data analytics service providers across a range of sectors. And that is creating a world where it is safe for people to share data, to create zones where people know how the, the data will be used and that enable uh, individuals and businesses to understand how they can retain control over what is a key business asset or ensure that they derive a fair return for use of what is a valuable asset. And both of those issues are important because here we're, we're talking not only about issues of protection of competitive advantage, but we're also potentially talking about issues of inequality of bargaining power between a farmer and somebody who is collecting data uh, about their operations and who sometimes is not willing to make a, fair, a full disclosure about the value of that information to them. Now farmers of course have always had a, uh, an interesting relationship with the truth. Um, I was brought up on a farm and I've owned farms and uh, one of the things that's always intrigued me is how the front paddock is always the best paddock regardless of the quality of the soil in the front paddock. So we all know that farmers are good at putting on a show for their neighbours. And similarly, the yields seem to increase the closer you get to the pub and <laughs> to go up proportionately to the number of schooners consumed. So the truth and data don't necessarily bear a close relationship when it comes to farming. But they are increasingly going to bear that relationship. And it is a real problem today because when you ask a lawyer uh, who owns data, who controls data, you're going to get a very complicated answer. And the short reason that you will get a complicated answer is that there is no simple answer. Today, in many cases, it is unclear who owns data because lawyers don't know how to characterise data within existing categories of legal property. That might sound bizarre, but that's the reality. Now, that doesn't mean that data is inherently valueless. Indeed, I know many of my clients have built businesses entirely on data and human beings uh, using data. Indeed, my own legal business is a good example of a business built precisely that way. But the reality is that copyright law doesn't protect data and privacy law doesn't protect most data that is of value to farmers. Privacy law protects information about individuals, personal details about individuals. It doesn't protect valuable information garnered in the course of a farming operation. As I said, copyright doesn't protect data because copyright is about human beings doing creative things and expressing those creative things in a particular way. And data, although it might be big, is pretty dumb. What is smart is the algorithms and the software that executes those algorithms, and that's what's protected. But the data that is then used, that is the fuel for those algorithms, is not protected. So how do we get around this? How do we deal with data? Well, there are two uh, areas of law that do come to our aid. 
One is the law relating to confidential information. And broadly, that's a set of principles that were developed in the ecclesiastical courts uh, many centuries ago. And in essence say that um, the law will come to the aid of someone who is uh, ripped off by another where they disclosed information to that person in conditions where the person ought to have known or knew that it was confidential and they've used it contrary to um, that uh, implied duty of confidentiality. That's the law of confidential information. In the US they talk about trade secrets, which is a similar concept. The problem with that is that you have to establish, firstly, that it was disclosed under conditions of confidentiality, and secondly, that it remains confidential. As soon as it goes into the public domain, it is no longer confidential, and yes, you might sue the person who wrongly put it in the public domain when they shouldn't have, but um, it's kind of uh, closing the stable door after the horse has bolted. Then we're left with the old stalwart of the law of contract. And the law of contract gets a fair old bashing nowadays because all of us who have mobile phones sign many contracts every day that none of us bother to read. It's called I Agree um, <laughs> as you download the latest app. And um, so we've kind of got pretty inured to the concept of accepting contracts that we don't read. And um, I'm afraid that most data analytics contracts uh, trade a bit off that propensity of people nowadays. Um, one of the things that I discover as a lawyer working in the privacy space is that it's generally not worth reading the first five pages of a privacy policy because the real action happens down on pages six to eight. And um, that's pretty true of a number of the data analytics contracts that are around today as well. But a contract can protect the confidentiality and give you rights in the data that you generate. You just have to read it and make sure that it says the right things. Now there's a few things that um, make that a little bit easier and really this speech is by way of introduction to um, Mary Kay and some of the work that the uh, Farmers Bureau in the US have been doing around capturing the key principles that uh, that farmers can follow to protect themselves when dealing with data. And uh, those principles can then be used, as it were, as a checklist um, for contracts um, that are presented to farmers by people with whom they deal. Uh, I think that it's a terrific initiative. Uh, it's only from November of last year. We've not seen anything similar in Australia. But I would hope that one of the things that we will explore at the back end of this conference is how we might uh, adapt those principles to Australia and ways in which we can help farmers evaluate contracts that they're presented with um, to understand that their rights are being adequately protected and, as I say, the second element, which is equally important, that they're getting fair value for any uses that are being made of that data. Of course, the other thing we heard today is that we've got a foundational problem as well, and that is that a lot of the data that is being generated, for example, on the tractors, is not actually getting off the tractors onto a computer, or if it's getting onto a computer, it's so damn uh, impenetrable that nobody is actually making use of it. So we have a number of problems today. Firstly, who owns or controls data? Um, and secondly, how we make it actually usable to ordinary human beings. And um, farmers, like lawyers, believe it or not, are ordinary human beings. And we do need the data presented to us through dashboards or other uh, visual presentations in ways that is compelling. And we need data that will actually help us make decisions. And I thought one of the interesting things I read in the preparation for this talk was that, uh, at least, and this was developed in the context of croppers in the US, that your average cropper in the US not only has about 40 seasons to make the right or wrong decisions, but in the course of those 40 seasons makes approximately 40 key decisions that affect the outcome uh, for that growing season. Now, I haven't attempted to translate that across to the number of decisions that you might need to make 
uh, in Australia as a fat lamb producer or uh, as a dairy farmer or whatever. But I'll hazard a guess that uh, in most agricultural sectors there are 40 to 60 key decisions that are made in the course of a season um, that affect the outcome. And one of the real tests for big data will be can it move beyond the promise of the future to actually affecting and assisting a significant number of those actionable decisions that need to be made? Because if big data only helps on two or three or 40 decisions, that's still 37 places to get it wrong, and that's too many. So um, with that introduction, I'd like to ask Mary Kay to join us, and then we'll have some Q&A with some opportunity to to drill um, Mary Kay uh, immediately following. Thank you. Well, thanks, Peter, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, you know, I want you to know the title of this presentation was assigned to me by Andrea, but I did try to focus on uh, where we've come from and to give you a little bit of time perspective and uh, maybe come up with some lessons if indeed the, uh, that you do consider doing some similar things to what we've done. Um, I would say that we do in the U.S. consider big data to be sort of the third of the big three uh, items that will bring agriculture along. I think there's a lot of excitement about it. There's a fair amount of intrepidation, and that's indeed what we're trying to work with. Um, but we feel like we're on a very fast uh, peddling machine and that, you know, faster we go, it seems like the further we get behind. Um, unbelievably to me, this process for us started uh, only 25 months ago. Uh, and it started uh, sort of as um, was said before, you know, you get your Apple iPhone and you just say, I agree, you don't read it. Uh, we started having farmers call us saying, hey, you know what, Mary Kay, uh, uh, some companies came and they wanted to offer me some prescription agriculture kind of services and it was getting to be planting. And I said, yeah, sounds great. And I signed it. And then I realized that uh, I really probably should have read the contract. And so when I had time and planting was over, I read the contract and I got concerned about what I saw. Uh, what do you know about this? And the answer was, I don't know anything about it. I would ask around at the American Farm Bureau. No one knew. We started making calls to our states. It was just kind of a whole new thing. Um, and some of the things that they were concerned about was some of the things we're still concerned about. A lot of the verbiage is very difficult. Um, when you read some of these contracts, and I thought it was interesting, someone this morning said, you know, we don't expect farmers to be veterinarians. Certainly we do some treating of the animals, but, uh, you know, we don't expect farmers to be lawyers either. And that's some of the big problems that we face. But looking at things like what is aggregated data, what is anonymized, uh, and certainly uh, a lot at the time of uh, contract holders had signed things that said, uh, we probably aren't going to share your data, but we might. And that was of great concern. So that's how we got started with it. And we decided we should do some education among ourselves. And so we had primarily the Midwestern states. I would say that the focus in this for the U.S. has been more from the corn and soybean sector with a good bit of input from the wheat sector than from uh, other places. Um, but we sat down with some of the bigger providers, some of the medium-sized providers and the smaller ones and just tried to understand what does your privacy contract say, what do the terms and conditions say, uh, let us see if we can get up to speed. And when we finished those meetings, uh, then we asked our farmers again, okay, <clears throat> what do you need from us? Is there something that you believe we ought to be doing as an organization? Uh, and in essence, what they said is, well, what we really probably need is some kind of an educational tool so that we can go out and educate our farmers about what is happening and what they can expect. So we put together a, a fairly simple, uh, I think it was about 10 pages of nine questions for a farmer to think about and to ask before they sign the document. Uh, we did that in September and sort of said, whew, we're done for a little while. And uh, in December, our delegates came together and put together significant policy on this. I don't expect you to read it, but for the Farm Bureau, our 400 and some delegates at the national level, after the counties have done it and the states have done it, develop policy on a whole host of things. And uh, as a lobbyist, we refer to that policy as our Bible for the next year. Uh, because if anything comes up, uh, legislative or regulatory wise, we can probably look at our policy and say our farmers thought X. And you can see that from when we started this in May to uh, December, uh, our farmers learned a whole lot about it and had a whole lot of things that they wanted to think about. So they passed a lot of policy. 
And I would say that you can sort of put it into these major questions. What's being collected? What's being done with it? Uh, do farmers uh, really have control of their own data? Uh, and one of the things that we haven't talked about much is, you know, can I be paid for my data? So <clears throat> I thought I would share with you just uh, maybe the five or six major items that I hear about from farmers and ranchers uh, when we're talking about data. Uh, and one of them is indeed who are we going to share it with. And in reading the contracts, when you see something like, we will share information only with our subsidiaries and business partners. And our folks say, who is a subsidiary? And who is a business partner? And as you know, uh, in the US, there's a lot of people who might not be business partners today, but tomorrow they are. And you know, how is that really going to happen? Uh, one of our big concerns was, uh, will you have a large company? Will you have a Monsanto, for example, that will have so much data in their database uh, that on the first day of harvest in a state like Iowa, they can look at what the yields are looking like, and indeed, they could go play the Chicago Board of Trade. <clears throat> um, one of the issues was on hacking. And certainly one of the messages that we've tried to tell our farmers is nobody wants to be hacked. Every company does everything they can. Um, but it's probably not a question of if someone's agricultural data being hacked at some point, it's more a question of when. So that's one of the things you want to think about as you're looking at that fulcrum and saying, are the benefits outweighing the disadvantages or where, does that, where do I come down on that? Uh, one of the other problems that we had was <clears throat> sort of a who do you trust? Uh, but one of the issues we had is uh, a farmer hands his data over to say John Deere, maybe he says, I have a great relationship with my John Deere dealer. But I don't like Pioneer worth a wit. Well, John Deere and Pioneer cut a, some kind of a, a subsidiary, or not a subsidiary, some kind of a business partner relationship. Does that mean, okay, we share with affiliates, business partners, does that mean that I was okay giving my data to my John Deere dealer, but I'm not okay having it passed along? Again, another of the big questions. For us, however, without a question, if you think about who they cared about most, certainly nobody wanted to share it with the government and nobody wanted to have it be Freedom of Information Act, foia -able. But probably the third rail for us is that we have companies who uh, indeed the farmer takes their information, they send it off, they get a prescription written back to them that says, you know, maybe you can plant 29,000 corn plants per acre here, but over in this part of the field, you could do 36,000, less fertilizer, more water, et cetera, et cetera, a real prescription. But unfortunately, when you send that prescription off, we have companies in the US that don't send it back to you. Indeed, they send it to the local dealer, saying, well, the local dealer knows more about you than we do, so we're gonna share it with them. If I was that big company, I would think that was a very good thing to do too, but as you can well imagine, we got lots and lots and lots of farmers who say, I don't want the guy who is the local dealer down the road from me having that information because they're gonna get then bid for me, bid against me for cash rent. I don't need that extra scrutiny. So uh, if I think about the third rail, I would say this is one of the biggest concerns that we've tried to uh, think about. Um, do our principals uh, do anything about that? No, is that something we're gonna have to continue to work on? Uh, absolutely. One of the other things, and I was saying at lunch, I'm kind of amazed that I think all morning I paid attention, and I don't think I heard the words concerns about environmentalists or concerns about the humane society type folks uh, come up in discussion. And I guarantee I couldn't have sat in a farm group meeting in the U.S. before uh, that would have happened probably within the first 10 minutes. Um, but we do have a lot of concern also about the information being released uh, to animal welfare groups, especially our livestock people feel like they've been hit very hard by those folks and they just don't want them to have any more of that information. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency is uh, also sort of right up there. Most of our folks would be okay if the Department of Agriculture had it, but they're not very happy about EPA. Um, and certainly last but not least is uh, a lot of farmers saying, my, my dad is valuable, I wanna pay for it. I think we have somewhat of an equal split, maybe a few less than half of farmers would say, well, the value I'm gonna get is by analyzing this and having it benchmarked or having it indeed um, a prescription written, but we have lots of folks who feel like the value is also an important thing. So about the time, uh, probably about like last February after we passed policy, the corn growers, the wheat growers, it got to me a much bigger issue. We got quite a few articles in the US written. And if you look at these articles, most of them unfortunately were not particularly positive about big data. 
Um, they probably instilled a lot more fear in the country than we already had. So we, again, were peddling pretty fast to try to bring that back around. There were a few of them that came out positive and said, hey, this is a good thing. But again, there were people who knew nothing two years ago and all of a sudden all they were reading in the press was negative. So we had a lot of issues to, to deal with. So uh, after we got our policy that said, hey, guys, we're really concerned, go do something, um, the farmers union, the soybean and the corn folks had similar policies that told them to be engaged. And so after thinking about it a bit, we decided that maybe we should try to put together a working group of some of the ag tech providers and some of the farm groups and sit down and talk about this and see if there were some uh, things that we could come to agreement on. And so we put together this small working group. Um, it was based on the idea of, and um, these data was done after that, but in essence that, you know, a lot of people thought they owned their data, but they were very worried about the data security. Um, but indeed, they intended to find a way to use it in the future. So it was going to be a very timely group to work with. Um, now, I think it's interesting, and maybe it fits right into this uh, conference, Andrea, when you talked about what are you planning to use it for, uh, about 47% of the people, so somewhere right in the middle said, yep, I'm going to use it to optimize soil productivity. Uh, I think it's very interesting, the, high, the highest number there, though, 59% said, I'm just going to store it and maybe use it in the future. So we uh, did indeed work for about six months on these principles. They were a little more difficult to, to get down there than we had hoped, but we thought we made some good progress. And the original 13 groups that signed it said, you know, this is something, it's a living, breathing document. We don't intend it to be the end for all, but we think it's important that everyone try in their policies to again uh, think about the issues like confidentiality, like ownership or control of data, like how are you going to re retain that data? Can I end my contract uh, with a company on the data? So we came with that. We uh, then put it out to other groups. I think we have everybody in agriculture that signed, and we probably have another, I don't know, 25 agribusiness groups uh, around the country uh, that have indeed signed those principles. So a very wide range of people who said, yep, indeed, this is what we believe in. Now, I would say when you think about the lesson that um, I think it is important to make sure you get the right people in the room and that you get people that you have some kind of working relationship with and some kind of trust. And I suppose this happens in every group. You know, when we originally sent out the invitation to the ag tech providers, we sent it out to the six uh, groups there that were on the, one of the previous slides. And it took us a while. We had to work on a couple of them to say, hey, you know, will you do this? And uh, uh, three of them finally said yes, and then lo and behold, when you made those last three calls and said, hey, blah, 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 are on, will you join us? Okay. Uh, well, then I would tell you that my phone for the next month ran off the hook uh, from people saying, we got to be in the group, Mary Kay. We want in. We're bigger than them. We, we, we have a better relationship with you. I mean, uh, I took quite a few people yelling at me. I had one guy actually crying. I got to have my guys at the table. And what we explained was, you know what, um, it has nothing to do with who's our favorites here. It has to do with we put a working group together. At the right point, the first meeting is Farm Bureau's, and we're going to limit it because we want a discussion. We don't want a lecture. And we can't have 100 people in the room and think we can have any kind of reasonable discussion. But after that, we'll open it up. We'll ask other people, what do you want to do here? And uh, in essence, after the first meeting, people said, oh my gosh, you guys were right. We could no more do with 100 people in the room than not. Let's go ahead and finish this. And so we had a deal for those six months that it would continue to be just the 13 groups. And then when we came to something, we would open it up. And that's what you saw that after we finished, 37 groups said, yep, we agree with what you're doing. We want to come in. And by the way, now we want to be active players as you go forward and do other things. So. <clears throat> I think maybe one of the biggest lessons, and it shouldn't be a surprise, but one of the biggest lessons that we learned from this was that just the talking between the groups for those six or seven months made a huge difference. I think farmers learn things from the ag tech providers, and I think the ag tech providers learn things from farming. Um, I know that when uh, we finished the document, or actually before we finished the document, one of the CEOs said to me, you know, Mary Kay, um, I had our lawyers draft our privacy policy two years ago, and I signed it, and I thought it was good. And then after we started having these discussions, I realized I should go back and read our privacy policy. And not only did I find that our policy doesn't say what we're doing, but it certainly doesn't say what we want our customers to think we're doing. So I've revised our privacy policy. 
Um, I had another CEO, one of the 37 groups are on, say, don't publish that yet. Let me get my privacy policy changed. I want to put my name on there. It'll be really obvious. And we said, you know what? The time will come. Change it. After you change it, call us. We're happy to add you. Um, and I had another one, which was amazing to me as a farmer, say, you know, Mary Kay, I never thought about big data, and I never thought that farmers would really think we would use their data to play the Chicago Board of Trade. But now that I know, I put in the policy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, one of the bigger things that came through me was uh, the idea that one of our policies, the long list I showed you there, said, what we want to do is we want to be able to remove our data, regardless of whether it's just my data that I put in there, or if everyone in this room had put data in and it had been aggregated, I still wanted my data back. My farmers still want it back. But through lots of discussions, we found out, okay, not very hard to get my data back, but kind of impossible to say, okay, we have this aggregated pool, now we're going to let you pull it out. Um, I had a fellow tell me the other day that for the average email, it goes through 46 different servers. So how do I get my data back from 46 different servers? Pretty difficult. Um, and one of the other bigger things uh, that I learned, and this may not be as um, make as much sense here uh, in uh, Australia, since you don't have as many renters and some of those agreements, but uh, indeed about ownership and control. And you know, I think uh, if you ask farmers, obviously 81% said, hey, we own our own data. But if you ask companies, I think 100% of the people say, oh, it's the farmer's data. And what a very wise person, Charles at John Deere taught me is, um, you own your data if you own your data. Because who owns it if I'm a tenant or is the landlord the person that owns it? What if I crop share? What if I hire my local co-op to come in and do the spraying for me? It's their equipment, it's their piece of GPS equipment, et cetera. Is it theirs or is it mine? Uh, all sorts of questions. And so one of the things that we do indeed spend a lot of time talking to farmers about now is, uh, before you can ever figure out who controls the data, you got to figure out who owns it. Is it you or is it the other guy? Um, we still have a lot of intrepidation, lots and lots of people very fearful of the data. That's one of the things we're working about. Uh, as uh, Peter mentioned, lots of people tell me 80% of the stuff gets left. Uh, we had a fellow who did a beta test, put 103 little boxes on the computer, and he went in, 20 people took it off, 20 people had somebody else take it off. Uh, the other 60-some, even though they paid $1,300 for the year, they just left it on the piece of the equipment that they paid for. Kind of like looking at the pretty maps, and that's about it. Uh, one of the big things that we have found is that it's really hard, and we try about to do education, and everyone agrees about education, but the fact is that there is not just one audience in big data. Uh, there are people who are comfortable with technology, uh, but they need to understand more about privacy and security and transparency and that. There are other people who are not comfortable with the technology, and I would tell you, in general, that's a, a generation kind of thing in the U.S. Younger farmers tend to be a lot more comfortable about it. Uh, and we have the non-believers who say, you know, I know a whole lot more about farming than I could ever get from this data. Uh, I am simply not interested. But I thought a very funny story. We had a lot of education after the last Farm Bill about all the different programs. We made it such a simple Farm Bill. Uh, that we had educational sources, and Texas A&M did for us, and uh, they were telling that they would have farmers call, and uh, they had a website where you could put your information in and try to figure it out, and they had a lot more than one farmer call and say, what's the URL browser, where do I put what? So uh, I think we had a lot of, uh, a lot of problems with what that, what that came down to. Now, I would also make a very general statement about education, and this is uh, certainly not true of every company or every farmer, but you know, every person, whether it's an ag tech provider or a farmer group, will tell you uh, education is one of the biggest things we have to do. But in general, what we find are the companies tend to want to educate so that the fear will be removed from farmers and everyone will use the technology, whereas farm groups want to say, I want to reduce I want to help educate, and I want to leave it for farmers to be able to make their own decisions. So um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to cut it there because I think questions will be a lot more interesting. But uh, if I had one thing that sort of agitated me about our time working on big data, it was that I read this article in the paper about uh, Farm Bureau has written a peace treaty with the ag tech providers. 
And uh, you know what? It wasn't a peace treaty at all. I mean, to me, that sort of indicated there's an end. And there was not an end. There was a good discussion from people about wanting to move forward and continuing to be very much of a team uh, effort. And it also sort of indicated fighting to me. And there really wasn't the fighting either. So there are a couple of initiatives that we are uh, working on. In fact, I would share, but you're probably going to know more about those initiatives before we finish this session than many, many most farmers, almost all farmers in the US. But we have two things we're working on in the future. Uh, one is called a transparency evaluator. And it's going to be a little bit like a good housekeeping seal of approval. Uh, we're trying to make it very simple, where a farmer will be able to look at uh, any company that they may want to be doing business with and figure out, uh, is that very complex privacy policy or terms and conditions or whatever it might be, is it, uh, is it clear? Is it understandable? Does that company tell you whether or not they're going to sell or share your data? Does the company tell you in the contract whether or not uh, you're going to be able to get it back? And there'll be links to the specific place in the contract that you can look at. But again, it will have probably 10 questions. And if you get 10 out of 10, you're going to get a seal of approval that either says Farm Bureau or Farm, Bu Farm Bureau and corn and soybeans or whichever groups decide to participate in that so that just as a farmer isn't expected to be a vet, they're not expected to be a lawyer either. Um, our critics say to us, what, what Mary Kay, are you trying to do is say farmers don't have to read their contracts? And it's like, no, but I'm trying to provide it so that you don't have to go out and hire a lawyer to evaluate four or five contracts before you decide which company you want to go with. Uh, and the other thing we're working on is called an ag data cooperative. And I think it's going to be a very unique type of idea where we are working with Ohio State University, but it's intending to be um, a broad group of land grants. Um, and for people who are uncomfortable that John Deere has a big database, or Monsanto has a big database, or Dow has a big database, you'd be able to put your data there. Uh, it would be stored for you. If you want to push a button and say, share it with Case or share it with John Deere, great. Uh, it would be cleaned, where we have a whole lot of data right now. I would tell you that's probably not very clean. Probably doesn't do a farmer a whole lot of good. Uh, and eventually, we hope that it could indeed be turned into some kind of a value-added proposition for farmers. So we are uh, far from done. I uh, have lots of other ideas. Um, I can't quite give you lessons on the last couple of them, because we're, we're not sure that that's where we are. We've had a lot of discussion about, is this the right way to go? Um, but I think I would, I would emphasize that it's been a very busy two years. Um, I hear the discussion, OK, Australia is a little bit behind the US. Uh, you can't be too far behind, because we're only two years ahead if you were at uh, point zero right now. But I think it has been a really great experience, not only for our farmers, but for the companies that we work with uh, to indeed be able to have these discussions. And I strongly encourage you to consider that here in Australia, too. Uh, thanks for that, Mary Kay. We've got a few minutes for questions, and I just thought I'd lead off on one on the uh, sort of open uh, data initiative that you're talking about. Uh, do you think that will help uh, farmers better benchmark how productive they are against their peers in an environment where they don't actually have to let somebody know what's happening in their back paddock? I think so. We're, we're going to try to start sort of slow. Uh, the Europeans have a da data co-op similar to what we're thinking about. And uh, one of the benefits there is it is benchmarking. Uh, we're going to kind of try to walk before we run. Uh, probably won't benchmark every data point, but instead take things like uh, uh, plant, how many seeds are planted, what kind of yield predictions we get, et cetera. Uh, but Again, we think you could benchmark it. You can profit from it. You can hopefully feel secure about it. Uh, interestingly enough, we have so many people from uh, academia here. We've had quite a few deans of agriculture who have said, you know, because we intend to do this with the land grant universities, that it could be, quote, the savior of the extension service in the US. Uh, so I think a really interesting point there, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, would, have you thought about how you'd charge for that or how you'd cover the cost of doing it? We have thought about that. I think that at this point, we have enough uh, ag tech providers and sort of middlemen to fund the startup cost, all the business plan and the uh, 
uh, legal stuff that has to go through. Uh, probably farmers would have to pay some kind of a minimal amount, but we haven't uh, worked through that specific yet. But again, we think that uh, we can probably show them that there's enough benefit uh, that they would pay a reasonable amount for it, yes. And have most of the ag tech providers signed up to your principles? They have. Uh, now that's interesting. One of the things, Peter, that uh, in our transparency evaluator that we're still having a discussion about is um, are we just trying to ensure transparency? Uh, I.e. if you get 10 questions out of 10 about, yeah, I'm really clear with farmers. I've told them I'm either A, going to sell their data, or B, I'm not. Uh, or is this actually that you're agreeing to the principles? Because I could show you now um, people who are part of that 37 group who still say, we might share or sell your data. Now they're very transparent in the contract that they might do that. So the question is, are we asking in our, in our good housekeeping seal of approval that you're adhering to those principles or that you're just being transparent about it or some combination of the two? So do you think those debates that we've had to date, and I know there was a lot of controversy about uh, John Deere and uh, allegedly trying to bundle together control of data and sale of tractors, are those controversies a sort of point in time whilst the market sorts itself out and farmers understand what they should be expecting in terms of control of their data, or do you think those kinds of battles are likely to continue? Unfortunately, I think those battles are going to continue. Um, we have worked really hard to, um, we keep Congress notified that it's ongoing, but not to have this be a legislative or a regulatory battle. But uh, I think John Deere is probably caught up now, for example, in the what the auto industry is, where mm -hmm. you know it, it is possible that um, I, I buy a tractor and I use it for a couple of years and then I sell it to you, Peter, and when you go to turn it on, uh, the code doesn't work, and you got to call John Deere and pay 5000 It's not happening. I don't think it will happen, but it's a possibility, and it's happening in the car industry. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there are definitely legislators who want to be involved and say, I want to fix that problem. I want to make sure that uh, the second owner doesn't have to pay for codes of some sort or not. Yeah. Um, certainly there's going to be privacy legislation, not just about agriculture data, but about a whole host of things. And you know, we haven't even talked about drones, but what a nightmare that will be because uh, we have very little at least control over kind of where they fly. You're supposed to ask the farmer, can I fly over your field? But again, um, is it uh, the environmental working group? Is it EPA? Is it my neighbor farmer? Who's flying over my property with a drone? I mean, for us, it's a true paradigm shift because I think farmers everywhere are used to having a lot of privacy and think they're out there standing on their land and nobody, nobody's looking over their shoulder. And with the new technology, I think we're having a real paradigm shift in uh, is that really true anymore. So we've got time for a couple of questions from the audience. Can you state uh, where you're from and uh, who you are? Thank you. <coughs> Thanks. Deb Kerr, I'm the General Manager of Policy for Australian Pork Limited. There's been a lot of discussion today on farm level ownership of data and the service providers um, ownership of data and how that integrates. But I'd be really interested in um, your views on industry collated data. As an industry research and development corporation, we have traceability systems, quality assurance systems that are all integrated. It has information from producers, from abattoirs and, and so on. So it's really quite a powerful tool but we're also very cognizant of privacy and that producers and probably abattoirs would be quite sensitized to that but I'd be really interested if there are discussions in the US about industry collated data and where that might be at. So it's interesting we've had very few discussions specifically about uh, livestock issues in general it's been almost entirely on the crop sector um, Certainly, we spent years on the RFID and what do we do there, et cetera. But um, we've had, I would say, very little uh, uh, people in our livestock sector that have wanted us to be engaged, first of all. Um, but I think that there's been somewhat of a similarity when you talk about crops in the equipment industry in that I think that we look differently at the agronomic data, for example, than we look at the machine data. And I think there's, uh, 
not a whole lot of concern from farmers about, for example, sharing the machine data, a whole lot more concern about do I specifically share my agronomic data. Um, so again, I'm not sure I'm the best I'm not sure there is a great answer from the U.S. perspective on the livestock issue because it hasn't been a big deal. Any other questions out there? Thanks. Uh, Rob Bramley from CSIRO. Although my question's got much more to do with the curiosity of a private citizen than who I work for. Um, given that data like the soil data under, underpinning some of the um, decision aids that we heard about this morning was acquired by at the expense of the taxpayer, the very great expense of the taxpayer, I, I dare say. What's the philosophical difference between a large multinational corporation making money on the Chicago Board of Trade using farmer data and making a large profit on a fee-for-service basis using that data that they had no part in paying for, um, or no deliberate part in paying for, in terms of being able to provide the service that they're now charging farmers for. I, I mean, I think you, uh, I think you raise a good point, and uh, I think one of the education things we actually have to do with producers better is to explain to them what kind of data is already out there. Um, you know, what about Google Earth? What about satellites? You can already see a lot of what's happening. Uh, indeed, there is rainfall data. Uh, Sonny could give me a whole more list of things that's already available and in the public that I think a lot of our farmers just aren't aware that that is there. And so um, they probably are lumping data all together, not understanding what's already kind of public and what should be private. Um, and I, I would also be less than honest if I didn't share that I had lots of people when we were talking about principles, uh, lots of farmers say to me, well, Mary Kay, be a little bit careful on how you talk about sharing the information between farmers and companies because we want to be able to share it. I mean, I might be a pretty decent sized farmer and I want to share it with these five people at this table and I want to play the Chicago Board of Trade. I don't want uh, Case IH to do it, but leave it so that we can do it. So I'm not necessarily telling you it's a fair perspective. I'm just being honest about it. So I think we'd better call it a day there because we've got uh, another session uh, that we've run over just a bit on to. So we're moving next door, aren't we? Uh, yep, yep. So Mary Kay, that was fascinating and terrific presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.